Thank you very much, Jacques. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I think weaning from mechanical ventilation is uh, very important because it concerns all mechanically ventilated patients surviving the ICU. Uh, these are my conflict of interest. Please note that uh, as uh, one of the inventor of smart care, I still continue to work with uh, Dreger. Uh, to try to schematize the, the vast problems associated with winning, um, this consensus conference uh, proposed to separate the winning problems or the patients with, with winning issues into three groups. Uh, the first group, which in fact is the most, uh, the largest one, uh, is uh, simple winning. And simple winning does not mean that the process is simple, but it means that the first time you try to separate the patient from the ventilator, the patient is able to breathe alone. And the key issue here is to have in your ICU a screening strategy for these patients. The second group are patients who do not tolerate the first attempt and who need repeated trials, maybe up to one week. And there is usually a medical reason, sometimes uh, uh, often uh, uh, which can be treated. So you need to look to seek for the exact reason for failure. This is a group with difficult winning. And uh, the third group are a very small subgroup of patients, but who spend a lot of time in the ICU, many, many days. And these are often the patients we see as complicated weaning. Uh, and these are the patients for whom specialized units may be useful. I will not address the issue about these patients, but mostly about the two first groups. The, uh, there have been four studies and other ongoings trying to look at the distribution between the three groups of winning, and you see that uh, the two, f the two uh, largest studies show that the largest group is really the, the, the simple winning, which means that uh, because this concerns the largest number of patients, you, you need to have a strategy to look at these patients. And in fact, this was shown early in the first randomized trials in 1994. We published the first large randomized trial in winning, which was uh, uh, subsequently followed by a study by Esteban. And in fact, both studies show that the, 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 the strategy you decide to use for your patients for winning does really matter. Because there was a, a huge difference in the durations of mechanical ventilation, depending on whether you use SIMV, TP's pressure support, or other techniques. So the strategy does matter, but not only the strategy, for instance, in the two studies, uh, pressure support ventilation was used, but in our studies, it was the fastest method to separate the patients from the ventilator. In Esteban's study, uh, it was not better than SIMV, which is the worst method consistently in every study. And the reason may be simply that uh, in Esteban's study, pressure support was increased every time the respiratory rate was at 25, whereas we accepted respiratory rate up to 35, so patients were separated much earlier. So these studies clearly indicate that uh, what the clinicians are doing uh, have an enormous influence on the real duration of mechanical ventilation. And in fact, uh, this study in 1996 showed that if you use a systematic strategy to identify patients capable of breathing spontaneously, you reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation. Uh, this is a classical study saying we need a daily screening, very simple tools, then uh, a test of spontaneous breathing, and then a decision based on this test. I'm not going to go into details. Uh, an interesting finding is that in the control group, in uh, the vast majority of the patients, the mode of ventilation used was SIMV, which have, you have sh seen before was the worst in the randomized control trials. Uh, and it's interesting to, to try to understand why SIMV is so bad in all the studies regarding winning. 
Uh, SIMV is a, a mode of ventilation where you interpose mechanical breaths, like this one, assisted breaths, <clears throat> and spontaneous breathing, which could be with or without pressure support. When you look at the ventilator, you say, well, it's very different, the assisted breaths and the spontaneous breaths. The big surprise is when you look at what the patient is really doing. There is absolutely no difference, whatever the index you take, between the assisted breaths and the spontaneous breaths. In other terms, as a clinician, you're completely blinded to what the patient is really doing. So this is a very poor method to identify if the patient is capable or not of spontaneous breathing. And that's why you need screening tools and tests to detect the right moment where the patient can breathe alone. The most, uh, uh, the, the, the largest evidence we have about screening tests is for the F over VT ratio, which is uh, illustrated here. You disconnect the patient from the ventilator, you measure the tidal volume, you measure the respiratory rate, and when the ratio of respiratory rate over tidal volume is above 100 per minute, uh, it's re it usually indicates that the patient is going to fail. So for instance, a patient breathing at more than 30 breaths per minute with a tidal volume of less than 300 ml will have a ratio over 100. The interest of the screening test is to detect sometimes that the ratio is low when you expect, when you have no idea whether the patient will tolerate this connection. So it's a screening tool. And it has been criticized a lot because in many studies, it was found that uh, this tool did not really change the, the, the real uh, uh, detection of patients able to breathe alone. And the reason is illustrated here. It's, it's a, a bit complicated slide, but it indicates all the studies during winning which used the F over VT ratio. And some studies used this test at a time where the probability of success was around 50%. You use the test, you have absolutely no idea whether your patient is going to fail or to success. Whereas in other studies, the test was used when the probability of success was more than 80%, which means that you as a clinician, you're pretty sure that your patient is going to, to succeed the, the, the winning test. And at this point, it has absolutely no interest. A screening test should be used as early as possible. So if you go back in your ICU and say, I need a screening strategy, it means use a test as early as possible before you have a, a clear idea whether your patient can be extubated or not. Probably the simplest screening test may be uh, use a low pressure support uh, test. You simply not disconnect the patient from the ventilator and turn down pressure support to seven centimeters of water without PEEP. Uh, Pressure support by itself may not be the best diagnostic test for extubation. I do think that the best diagnostic test is the T-piece. You see that uh, data we, we published uh, several years ago and which have been confirmed by several studies showing that if you look at the work of breathing during a T-piece and just after extubation, the work of breathing is exactly the same. In other terms, the T-piece is the best method to reproduce the post-extubation period. So to really, as a diagnostic test, is excellent. When you compare low pressure support and TPs, in fact, you all often find that more patients are extubated with pressure support because it's a little bit easier for the patient. And because the rate of extubation failure is relatively low, uh, probably in the, the most of the studies, you cannot find really a, a clinical difference. However, at the individual level, when you are dealing with a difficult patients, and this was a series, for instance, of patients with cardiac problems, uh, look at what the patient is doing under pressure support plus PEEP, 
So low pressure support and PIP compared to a T-piece, which I remind you is the best way to simulate what will happen after extubation. So I think the low pressure support test is a very good screening test, but to be safe before extubation in difficult patients, I strongly recommend to go to a T-piece trial. If we look now at the winning difficulties, so the group of patients who do not tolerate the first test, one major medical issue is winning induced pulmonary edema, which was uh, very nicely demonstrated already in 1988 by Francois Lemaire. You have a patient uh, disconnected from the ventilator, and here you have the wedge pressure, the arter pulmonary arterial occlusion pressure, which is normal under controlled mechanical ventilation. And this patient was a COPD. Every time he was disconnected, everything was saying, well, this patient has bronchospasm. It was not bronchospasm, it was pulmonary edema, as indicated by the high elevation of wedge pressure. And in fact, it may be cardiac failure on a, on a poor left ventricle, but it may be also to a large extent, simply fluid overload. And there are many studies showing that uh, if you look at fluid balance at the time of extubation, for instance, uh, not only for winning failure, but here it's for extubation failure, the higher the fluid balance, the higher the risk of extubation failure. And in this study with uh, Armand Meconso de Sap, we found that before the first spontaneous breathing trial. Before we try anything, the BNP level was a very strong predictor of failure. So BNP level elevated, maybe fluid overload, left ventricular dysfunction, or both. And as a strategy for winning and for uh, trying to reduce the number of difficult patients, we did these randomized control trials where we used BNP to drive fluid management during ventilator winning. And we compared uh, two approaches, one which was the daily practice, and the other one where BNP was uh, measured every day. And of course, the group receiving, uh, where BNP was measured received more furosemide. Interestingly, the other group also received furosemide, but uh, one, two, or three days later. And the fluid balance was more negative in the group uh, having repeated BNP measurements. This turned into a significant difference in the winning duration. There were uh, shorter time on mechanical ventilation. And we'd, when we looked at the subgroup, the subgroup for which the effect of BNP measurement was the strongest was a group with left ventricular dysfunction as expected. So this is a strategy which can really help you to reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation. Another strategy is the use of automated systems. I have no time to go into detail, but we see and we will see more of these automated ventilation systems. Um, these systems are not doing better than what you do or what an expert do. They just try to reproduce what you do as a standard of care uh, uh, and mimic the medical reasoning, saying if respiratory rate is high, tidal volume is low, then I increase pressure support. And you try to write rules which are embedded into a computer, uh, reproducing the, the medical reasoning. So I think the main interest of this system is not to replace experts or use in complicated situation, but the main advantage is that they can work 24 hours a day, whatever the day of the week, a thing which we have difficulties to do. Uh, so this system called the IntelliVent is very ambitious because it tries to manage everything, and we don't have a lot of uh, data yet about winning. Another system on which we worked for many years is uh, more focused, just uh, driving the pressure support level and trying to decrease pressure support level until uh, we reach a minimal level 
at which the patient is still in a, what we call the comfort range in terms of respiratory rate and tidal volume. And then there is an, an indication on the ventilator that the patient may be separated. So it's an incentive for the clinician to test. Well, uh, maybe it can be extubated, which of course depends on also the clinical judgment. When we tested it in uh, this first multicenter study, uh, it was still a prototype, we were really surprised by the result. Uh, we, we found it was in five centers having all protocols of winning, a major reduction in the duration of winning and mechanical ventilation. Since then, this is the, uh, the Kaplan-Meyer curve. Since then, it has tested in several studies. This is a, a large study in surgical patients showing no difference in the overall group, but the significant difference in the subgroup of cardiac surgery patients. And this is the last uh, trial, which was interesting because one of the criticism of these studies was to say it was not compared to a very strictly applied protocol. And this was tested here. Uh, the protocolized weaning was uh, done every day by respiratory therapist and it was compared in nine adult ICU to automated weaning. The results are again similar, a very impressive reduction in the duration of mechanical ventilation with the automated system. And the main reason again is not because it's, it's more clever than what we do, just because it's doing it all the time. So the automated weaning uh, at an early stage as the ability to shorten weaning. In some ICU, some group of patients, it just simply perform as well as what you do as usual care, but in other uh, ICU, it does much better. Uh, no serious side effects have been described and future improvement may improve its efficacy. So in conclusion, I would say, if you want uh, some winning, winning strategy, uh, you, you need to have a systematic screening you need to have a good diagnostic test before extubating your patient for safety issue. Fluid overload is a major uh, issue and uh, BNP measurements may help. And automated winning now or in the future may also be uh, advantageous. Thank you very much.